All right, so I have created a video about ear and eye disorders, and if you know me at all, you know I hate ear and eye disorders. So the fact that I made this video means that I must really love all of my students. So I am here just to do a simple breakdown of some of these disorders to help you differentiate one from the other. This is not an in-depth about what each of these disorders is and the treatments and everything, but this is just kind of to help you to start to understand the difference between one and the other. So let's start by learning about cataracts. So if you want to think about cataracts, think of them as being a cloud over your lens. So overall, cataracts will block your vision because literally they are an obstruction from getting um, you know, that image through to your eye to get to your optic nerve to send to your brain uh, because um, there is this cloud that is completely blocking it. And that cloud is just a bunch of proteins that, you know, with age have started to build up. Um, but, you know, what makes this difference? How can you remember cataracts? So cataracts are a little different because of some of the symptoms that might have. So people that have cataracts usually will complain of a... Um, you know, more of a progressive loss, so, you know, maybe it gets harder to see when it's at night. Um, they may complain of a glare when they're trying to look at things. I mean, usually the biggest difference is you can actually see that cloud over the lens as they get older, and usually cataracts are going to be seen in older people, and uh, with cataracts, you know, you, the people have two options. They can either, you know, kind of change their lifestyle, get a stronger prescription for their glasses, stop driving at night, etc., or they can have surgery and get the cataract removed or their lens replaced. Um, so that's what kind of separates cataracts. The other thing I'll say is that, you know, a lot of times um, people with cataracts will have trouble with color visions, like differentiating colors one from another. So then there's retinal detachment. And so retinal detachment, think of this as the vision gets unplugged. So as you can see, like in this picture, um, literally there's a tear um, in your, uh, we call it that posterior portion of your eye, but effectively from that tear, that tears off from the blood supply to the eye. So what happens if there's no blood supply to the eye? Well, that means blindness. You know, you can see it's in that back area, right where that nerve is that connects to your brain, that tells your eye what it's seeing. So this is a literal tear. Um, you know, and this can happen for a variety of reasons, uh, you know, from having other previous surgeries or eye trauma, etc., um, some people are just more genetically uh, predisposed to having it. And once you have one retinal detachment, you have a higher chance of having your other eye have a retinal detachment. But um, just think of it as a literal tear. Um, you know, it's not something you're necessarily going to see on the outside like you did with cataracts. Um, but um, this person is going to have um, symptoms like light flashes, like they're going to kind of see like there's light flashes in front of their eyes. They may kind of feel like they have um, vision changes in the, in the sense that they see like cobwebs or like a hairnet appearance over their eyes. Um, and when it starts to get really bad, like when the, you know, it's completely detaching and you're losing that vision, um, you know, it's this painless loss of vision and a lot of people describe it as this curtain going across your vision. So obviously this one's a lot more serious than the cataract. You know, the cataract can be managed, um, you know, uh, with just some surgery or conservative management with retinal detachments concerned an emergency. And they're going to usually need to have emergent surgery to, you know, close that tear through different things. So um, that's kind of what sets retinal detachment from the others. Then there's glaucoma. So glaucoma, you can think of glaucoma like hypertension of the eye. Um, it's too much fluid or pressure in the eye, um, or the fluid is getting blocked from draining from the eye. And that's important to note because that's going to really tell us like what our treatments are going to be. So you can kind of see in this picture, normally there's like this stuff in the front of the eye, in front of your lens. Um, uh, you know, it has a fancy name called trabicular meshwork. Um, but usually it's like this great place where stuff can just drain really easily. Well, um, you know, with people with glaucoma, what happens is that either acutely, like very rapidly, um, this gets blocked or over time, you know, it gets blocked. Um, and so what really makes this one different, the symptoms that this patient's going to see, um, if they have the chronic type where slowly over time they start to build up this fluid or pressure in their eye, um, or they slowly start, um, you know, getting this um, blocked 
um, you know, drainage pathway in their eye, then the symptom they're going to complain about is tunnel vision or loss of a peripheral vision. Um, and a lot of times they're not going to notice it till it's completely gone. So they don't lose their central vision, you know, like a lot of the other ones like cataracts and retinal detachment, they're losing like everything, their central vision. This is a peripheral vision that they're losing. Um, and that's again for chronic glaucoma. And that's, if you think of, if you, you might hear it called by different names. So chronic is also known as um, you know, the, uh, you know, open angle glaucoma. Um, it's an open angle, so it's not as blocked. Um, and so in comparison, in acute glaucoma, acute hypertension of the eye, this is where there's a sudden, like almost like a sudden blockage, like think kind of like an MI where, you know, things have been building up, those plaques have been building up, but all of a sudden out of nowhere, boom, like there's no way for that fluid to drain out of the eye. So what happens, as you can see in this um, picture the pressure builds up and it puts pressure on that optic nerve so this patient is different this um, patient with acute glaucoma it's also known as closed angle or narrow angle glaucoma they are going to complain of sudden extreme pain in their eye um, they may also see colored halos around lights um, but they're going to actually really feel it. you know that chronic person that has chronic or um, you know open angle glaucoma they're going to be more you know kind of a slow insidious on Onset where this acute person, they you're going to know they have an issue going on. It's going to be sudden extreme pain. Um, and, you know, a lot of this, like we said, this is like ocular hypertension. So they're going to be on a lot of medications to decrease hypertension. What did we treat? How did we treat hypertension? Alpha blockers, beta blockers, medications to get fluid off. Because remember, fluid is pressure. But effectively, you know, all the medications that we give for this are going to do one of two things. They're either going to decrease how much fluid you're making in your eye so there's less pressure. Or they're going to open up that blockage so you can drain that fluid that is building up. So let's move on to ear problems. So there's a few ear problems. Um, the first one we'll talk about is otosclerosis, which is an ear bone problem. Um, it's a malfunction of the stapes, which is the bone in your ear, one of your bones in your ear canal um, that allows you to conduct your hearing. So you're not able to conduct your hearing because it kind of forms like this bony overgrowth. Um, but effectively, like it's just like a missing piece, you know, and you kind of need all these pieces to work together to send that sound in from the air into your ear through all these bones and then into your brain. So, um, you know, what makes this different than other ear problems is when we test this person, um, there's something called the tuning fork test, and that's where they put that weird little metal, metal thing on your head and see if you can hear the vibrations. A person with otosclerosis can hear those vibrations because they can still conduct hearing through their bone, but through the air, because this um, the uh, stapes within their ear is not working, they cannot hear through air, but they can hear here through vibrations in their bone and that's going to be really confusing to you but just keep in mind um, it's not all of their hearing is at lost it's only hearing uh, is lost through the air um, and you know the other thing that's going to make this one different is they're going to have bone treatments because remember this is a bone problem so we are going to have like a um, uh, not a bone transplant, I was about to say bone transplant, but, um, uh, you know, they can replace that bone, that stapes in the ear, um, with a prosthesis, or they can also alternatively give them vitamin D and calcium, which are going to help build up that bone, uh, problem that you have in your ear. Um, so effectively, this is all about the bone, if you have not already gotten that so far. <clears throat> So comparatively, um, you know, Meniere's disease, you know, the um, otosclerosis was really focused on hearing. Like your main problem there is hearing. It's not really a problem with balance where Meniere's disease has kind of a mix of both. If you think of Meniere's disease, it is a ear heart failure if you want to think of it. So it's not well understood, but this fluid, uh, fluid, ugh, excuse me, fluid accumulates in the ear um, and it ends up, you know, causing this rupture of this membrane in your ear, this lymphatic tissue in your ear. Um, and it causes this loss of balance or vertigo. There's this like fluid imbalance in your ear effectively. And this um, repairs itself eventually. And then like I have here, wash, rinse, repeat. This happens over and over and over again. So this is something that has like exacerbations or attacks. So effectively, the people with Meniere's, like they have this fluid buildup, 
um, this membrane ruptures, you have this horrible imbalance, you're like on your back, you can't stand up straight, you can't do anything. Um, and then that membrane repairs, the fluid goes back where it's supposed to get, and then you're okay for a while and like you have no problems. But then again, later on, it might happen a couple times a year, multiple times a month, everyone's different. Um, but effectively, it's this wash, rinse, repeat, you know, you build up fluid, uh, membrane ruptures, imbalance, membrane um, repairs itself and then you're rebalanced, you know, and then it keeps going over and over and over again. But when I say like there's an imbalance, like this person cannot get up, like it affects, it can um, severely affect their ability to function um, and cause incredible safety issues. Um, they also have, you know, a uh, transient loss of their hearing as well um, when that fluid is um, building up. And so they have this cool test called the glycerol test that can kind of um, let us know if it might be Meniere's disease. And effectively what gl glycerol does is helps pull fluid um, where it's not supposed to be. So um, if you're given glycerol and you're having like an acute attack of Meniere's, um, and remember, Meniere's is a fluid accumulation, what's glycerol going to do? It's going to decrease that fluid. So if we give a patient um, glycerol and their hearing improves, it's likely that they have Meniere's disease because it's that fluid accumulation. The glycerol helped to decrease that fluid accumulation so they could hear better. Um, so again, you know, this one is a little different um, because it comes and goes, so it comes and attacks. It happens more in middle age, and I should have mentioned, you know, otosclerosis happens really in young people. It's the otosclerosis um, is like the most common cause of hearing loss in young people. Um, and like I said, the other difference with Meniere's is going to be that it's not just a hearing issue, it's also a balance issue that um, those vertigo symptoms, so we're going to need to treat them for those vertigo symptoms. Um, people with Meniere's will also complain of a fullness in their ear because literally they are, they're full of this lymphatic um, fluid in their ear. Um, and the difference, you know, otosclerosis, we had all of those treatments we could do, we could treat the bone. You know, Meniere's has no cure. Um, the only thing that we can do is treat the symptoms. We can um, think of all the things that we do for fluid accumulation. We can give, you know, diuretics, we can um, put them on a low sodium diet, we can... <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, put a shunt in to drain some of that fluid. Uh, and worst comes to worst, we actually just cut that nerve, that nerve that's telling the fluid to accumulate, but that also means they're going to lose their hearing. Um, but usually this happens in one ear. Otosclerosis, on the other hand, the last disease we talked about, it usually happens in both ears, but one's worse than the other. But with Meniere's, it's usually just one ear that it's happening in. Um, so sometimes worse comes to worse. Like I said, we just, um, we stop that, um, you know, sensation from happening because if it gets to the point where it's so unsafe or this person's not functioning, it's better to have no hearing in one ear than to have such bad imbalance that they could have a serious, you know, um, life-threatening injury. Last but not least is BPPV, which is really, if you want to say it in a non-fancy way, is vertigo. So it's all about, it's positional vertigo. Um, and in the first word there in the B is benign. So if you want to think of anything, you know, we just talked about two pretty depressing ear conditions. BPPV is very treatable, very fixable. So um, if you did not know this, um, you have crystals in your ear. And if you are just hearing this now and you never knew this, you're welcome. You do have magic crystals in your ear. Um, those magic crystals are supposed to be in a certain place, in a certain canal in your ear, and they help to keep you balanced. They help, you know, tell your body, you know, where it is in the world so that it can balance itself out. Um, however, sometimes because of the way we position ourselves, certain activities that we might do, or sometimes for unknown reasons, these crystals can migrate or get lost. And so I always think BPPV, um, uh, is lost ear crystals. Um, and what happens when they get lost, if they go into the wrong canal, then it's like your whole body's like, whoa, 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 what the heck just happened? You know, I don't know where I am. I don't know what's going on. Um, so effectively, um, it can cause this loss of balance and vertigo. So what makes it different is there, you can see here, there's no change to your hearing. This is all about balance and um, that vertigo sensation. Um, it only affects the balance. It's not affecting the hearing at all. Um, and it also, it's easily fixed. Like I said, these crystals are just lost. They need to be brought back to their home. So we do this thing called the Epley Maneuver, um, and it helps to kind of reposition the crystals to the canal that they're supposed to be in um, and effectively get uh, rid of those symptoms. So uh, compared to all the others, it is very, very manageable. Um, it can come and go. So, you know, these um, this can some 
Um, this can happen to people chronically, but like I said, easily fixed um, with these uh, maneuvers to get those crystals back to their home. So that's all I've got for you today. I hope this helped to clarify some of the, you know, figuring out which one's which. Um, have a good spring break.